Ladies and gents, this is UX, and this is Total War Warhammer 3 review by the channel Mandalore Gaming Part 2, I guess. I already see the first portion of this, uh, you know, yesterday. Total War Warhammer 3 is obviously incredible game so far. All the trailers and every, I guess, gameplay thing that I've seen is incredible. Mandalore is going really deep into this one. Uh, so far, everything he's talked about just. Uh, sounds great and some of the issues are kind of reasonable knowing what type of game this is and what type of uh, issues that games like this would face so some of the compromises that they had to make is kind of understandable for the you know gameplay mechanics point of view but yeah so let's waste one remember if you like my Rickson, don't forget to like subscribe so i know which type of videos to react to more check out the rick sunday there's a link in the season check out the cards check out the cards and yeah let's watch it How is the audio this time around? Damn. Okay, what? It's the same rich soundscape as before. Every battle has layers upon layers of it. They're even yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I wouldn't want to see every audio from Nurgle's battle. Some of the things that Nurgle's demons do, ugh, I don't want to hear the sound of that. Seems to be more variety in the units addressing who they're fighting. More trash talk is exactly what I like to see in Warhammer. Another yeah. good news, while not as deep and trait based as the old games, they did bring general speeches back. You just need to be close to them before the fight. You will see your families again! This, the Storm Dragon swears! Your children will grow old and fat thanks to your bravery this day! Mel Gibson style speeches. The eyes will say that they met God, and he is great and terrible! Battle means death. Death means decay. <laughs> Decay means disease. Okay. Disease means glory. The audio team went to work once again, and <laughs> like last time, I'd only have good things to say. The only time I can recall being underwhelmed at how a unit sounded was with the ogre lead belchers. It's a quality effect, but those are cannons. But I'm not going to go through the game unit by unit because I'd go feral. My key audio issue before was the music, and it wasn't bad. It seemed too subdued and controlled, especially compared to the trailers. You still have that kind of thing, especially since it uses music from the old games. But even the more intentionally dry tracks have more going on now. Managing cities as Zinch, I was hearing weird chimes and horror strings. Ooh, I like that. Sinister. We witnessed eternity. When it came to factions like the Ogres and Kislev especially, there are some standout tracks now. The Ogres will bounce between Mongolian tribal music and these big bombastic war drums pretty frequently. It's the exact kind of music I didn't really expect to be hearing playing this, and it's great. <laughs> Ooh, tribal type. I love it. Where the yours? Hunter! The more provides! The strongest! The fatties! Serve the ogres! Looking for him. It sounds like some people at Creative Assembly are able to show more of their power level. Oh, no, we're 
<laughs> yeah, seriously. Here comes the bat. <laughs> Yeah, no jokes. Uh, holy shit. This has the best music in the trilogy. It's some of the best a Total War game has gotten in a long time. Judging on how it sounded before, this was probably a risk, and it paid off. It can add so much energy to the battles. It's not constantly bombastic, but it sounds like music that was allowed to be noticed and appreciated rather Look at this shit right here. What's happening here? Is that, is that corn and that's why it's burning in the distance there? That than just being a backdrop. It can be the kind of score that makes you do a very dumb charge in a fight because it just feels so right to. It's a massive improvement and I'm so glad for it. Gameplay wise, there's a lot of new stuff to cover, so I'll do what I- Alright, so as far as uh, sound and music, I've said this in the, you know, one of the previous videos of, uh, uh, you know, any game review. That music and sound is extremely important if you're trying to create an immersive experience. There it's the word immersive again. But yeah, seriously. Uh, Let's be honest, everybody loves Skyrim, right? But Skyrim wouldn't be Skyrim without its music and themes, right? Everybody has their moments in Skyrim and they're all attached to some kind of music and theme that played at the time. Witcher 3, best game ever. Why? Because of the themes and music. That's pretty integral part of it. Because everybody remo remembers that tavern song, right? Everybody remembers some music plays when the you know, battle starts. I mean, we have our, you know, senses, and hearing is pretty important one. So everybody creates awesome graphics and visual for our vision. But what about the hearing, right? Music and the sound effects are extremely important. So if you do that right, that alone just, you know, wins everything. And this so far looks incredible, all the battle sounds, right? All the different type of sound effects, you know, those things flying in the air makes the sound and paddle sound music. I like how ogres have this kind of a drum type of thing going with the tribal type of music. What I did last time. Go faction by faction and pick out the new stuff along the way. Easy. Kislev. Residing in Kislev is a hard life. The climate rarely goes above sub-zero, the local wildlife is aggressive, and it's regularly attacked by interdimensional monsters. Every so often the local mayor will need to step outside to 1v1 a demon lord. So really, it's just <laughs> Russia. Except demons keep burning all their buildings down, so they can't climb on those as high as they'd like for no reason. They're led by an it's ice witch queen named Katerin, who constantly feuds with the leader of the orthodoxy, Kastalton. You've got the vodka makers, powerful squatting form, the babushkas, the bear cavalry. It's everything you'd expect. As far as the battlefield goes, they have an interesting roster. Most of their core units have hybrid roles. Regular Kassars have bows, but can also wade into melee combat with swords or spears. Their big armored brothers can hold their own in melee a lot better, but they can still whip out handguns. They do have some specialized units, but it's more about adaptability and versatility. Having a bunch of troops that can switch between ranged and melee and be decent at both gives you a lot of reactive room in your tactics. It also gives you more wiggle room to recover from mistakes. Say you weren't paying attention and you left your artillery undefended. Well, it's pulled by polar bears. Not Earth polar bears, Kislev polar bears. Which are somehow even more murderous. Yeah, even if it's caught, that artillery is going to be fine for a while. The roster yeah. includes Uncle Horse Archers for harass potential, solid infantry line holders, and if you're feeling Polish and a little tired of Zabavni Mish, you can send out winged hussars that have everything short of the funny number. You also get some new kinds of magic, including ice to try out. They're all about giving you options and things to experiment with, and it's no wonder it's recommended as a first campaign. On the campaign side, Katarin and Kastalton are competing for supporters. Getting to a tier before the other will unlock buffs for this faction, though they can be overtaken later. Another new resource called Devotion can be used to buy special religious buildings that usually give more supporters. You can also spend them on invoking the Motherland, which is similar to rituals in Warhammer 2. The entire theme is built around Kastalton, the state, and the orthodoxy versus Katarin, strange magic, and the ice court. Kastalton loves the bear, Katarin loves ice, by their powers combined you get the big ice bear. But let's get more into this rivalry. <laughs> On the campaign side, Katarin has control of the Ice Court. This lets you train magic lords and heroes over a series of turns with some dilemmas along the way. On the battlefield, the Ice Court brings the Ice Guard. These are deadly hybrid units that are good in melee and have slowing ice arrows. Combined with some spell buffs, the range game here can be supremely effective. Magic can be absurdly strong in this setting. So to counter her, Kastalton also has access to the Ice Court. Which is strange since he hates them and considers them heretics. He does have secular units like the Zar Guard, <laughs> maybe? They're just armored Kossars with a cape. Even that's too much because he doesn't buff Zar Guard at all. His faction bonus gives mild buffs to regular Kossars and a nice ward save for Patriarch Heroes. His entire skill set doesn't really go with this rivalry at all, except for a single one that affects building cost. Even the race for supporters increases relations with the opposing faction with each tier. This feels less like a rivalry and more like a race for a few buffs. Yet every faction in the game gets updated on who's winning this like it's some kind of big deal. 
To make it stranger, Castalton seems like a pious, though serious and suspicious man in cutscenes, but then in game he's like this raving lunatic. I get the sense that they weren't 100% on what to do with him. Even if they gave him a reskinned Ice Court mechanic, which trained boyars and patriarchs instead, that would at least be more thematic. Or maybe he shouldn't have it at all and instead buff the regional governors you can assign. While I rarely do this, I think this is a case where he needs new units. Because right now he's just a worse Volkmar. Volkmar the Grim. See, Volkmar came in a DLC with specialized fanatic and religious units. Warhammer 3 mentions the orthodoxy a lot, including black-robed secret police units that root out chaos. Too late for repentance, traitor! Him having some anti-magic spell-resistant police units makes a lot of sense to me. I would say he should buff some regular units, but there's an issue on that front. The regular units are already filled with ice magic. A while back, someone asked me if I thought Kislev was flanderized due to all the bears. I thought this was weird even before they showed off the new Kislev lore. Katarin did have a tabletop model where she was on a majestic ice sled. Now See, I, I remember playing Until Tournament 2004 and seeing uh, every character's backstories and detail, you know, written there. I highly doubt many people did that. I mean, they just played the game for the fuck of it, right? I saw Horus Rock and everybody's basically history there, right? How Rock is brother of some other guy who kind of looks like him. And there's so many entangled stories between different characters i love that portion so i like whenever a game that is you know basically a battle game right you just battle it out but they they are more lore friendly right some of the things you can do some of the traits they might have is based on lore which is awesome she's on a bear ice witches patriarchs it doesn't matter you get a bear i didn't like it before due to variety's sake but now there's a new problem in a race like Wood Elves, there's a clear distinction between the trees and forest spirits and the... Elves. But the campaign mechanics and the looks of the units themselves made them distinct. Kislev has state units, magic units, and then... Uh, this would be fine, but now we've said there's a government and religious institution rivalry and they're only begrudgingly working together to fight chaos. They're not mortal enemies, but if Castalton had his way, he would be the George Foreman of Grilling Witches. Having the units more separated <laughs> out could help in that department. Instead of magic sleds, just have sleds. The bear can lean more on representing the state. Instead of witches riding bears, they ride snow leopards since they're trained to protect the court members. The elemental bear could actually represent or be a reward for both factions coming together. As it is now, the whole rivalry aspect to the faction's roster just comes across as hollow. If they're going to go with this, I think they need more distinction as sub-factions. It is fun seeing York Berenson move up the Interpol Most Wanted list, but man, Biker Week in Austin doesn't have this many bears. Oh yeah, you could also unlock Boris Ursus. He has his own start position way out east and can kind of throw supporters at a group temporarily for some buffs. This seems especially tacked on now because he doesn't care about that. He just wants to expand the country's borders and fight chaos. Actually, I should get into that. Every once in a while, mysterious rifts of energy will appear across the map. These are the gateways to the Realm of Chaos and will start spreading corruption like nuts. Then they'll eventually start spawning armies and heroes, and that's where the trouble really begins. It's a world invasion, but some lessons have been learned since Warhammer 2. And it's clear some DLC features- Well, this is where, I guess, you know, land transforms slowly, right? If you don't stop corruption, corruption spreads and it changes the landscape, how it looks, that we saw in the previous part that I did. This is so epic. It's like Wood Elf Invasions were testing this. For one, you're warned they're coming. When they do, they'll have several turns of inactivity. You have some options on what to do. With an agent, you can simply close the rift. For a price. The economy won't like the rift closing fund, but it does stop the being devoured by demons fund. You yeah. can also use military forces to close it off, but they'll have to fight a small battle which gets bigger and bigger each time the rifts appear. Alternatively, you can leave it open and teleport a character across to a different rift. You still have a demon issue, but it's a much better commute. Most importantly of all, your faction leader can enter a rift to start an incursion in the Realm of Chaos. As you've already seen, the Realm of Chaos sucks. No matter the faction, your objective is simple. Barge in and make it even worse. Each realm is dedicated to a god and has its own separate challenges, though there can be questionable rewards in there too. In the realm of Khorne, there are many strange rogue armies. You'll need to spill a lot of blood to progress further. Some parts of it will offer powerful weapons like a cursed spear or a chain sword. This is a few years early on Total War 40k. Zinch's realm is an annoying maze. Slanesh's tempts you with more and more powerful rewards to leave. And Nurgle's is very stinky. Overcoming these trials will be challenging. The demons respawn endlessly, and sometimes other factions are also venturing around the realms of chaos. You'll need to overcome the realm's trial, and then face a demon prince in a new kind of fight called a survival battle. You want their soul, and if another faction beats you to it, you'll be kicked out of the realm and can't come back until all the rifts respawn. Only one soul per rift cycle, too, you can't double dip. 
There are some drawbacks. Uh, you have a chance. Ooh, I like how, you know, they tempt you to give certain buffs just so you leave. What? There's the mechanic like that? This is incredible. Maybe it would be so good if uh, somehow they add actual Chaos Gods in this. I mean, that wouldn't work, right? I mean, how could you just go there and beat a Chaos God? If they, if they literally add a one Chaos God there as a character, what was the story that they kick your ass? I mean, but that would be so good to see actual Chaos Gods there. I mean, you see, you see the lieutenants, one of themselves, I guess. I guess they don't manifest like that, right? Chance of gaining a negative trait while being in a Chaos Realm. These can be significant debuffs that you get multiple levels of. The only way to cure it is to sit your lord inside of a province capital and wait for a chance that it goes away. At best, fixing it is dull, and at worst, it is incredibly annoying. If you're playing a race like Ogres, you might not have easy access to a trait curing building. The same goes for someone like Scarbrand who gets all over the planet. Changes to supply lines means you can easily field more armies than before. But like 2's ritual campaign, you don't need to expand too much. It is a definite improvement that the mechanic doesn't outright punish you for expanding like it used to. They did have to warp the map in a strange way to accommodate the realms. It'll be interesting to see if they make it into the big combined map. A domination victory in this campaign is especially difficult. If another faction gets all four souls, they can go to the final battle and win the game. There's no magic intercept button this time, you have to physically slow them down in the realms. So where 2 sort of allowed you to ignore the main campaign and play more sandbox, this is much harder to do here. Beating the campaign won't give you any kind of map painting reward or buff. For better and worse, the main mode is much more objective focused than before. The sandbox will come eventually, but this is what you have for now. Alright, let's get into the new survival battles. These can be some of the longest in the series, and they're not kidding about survival, it's an endurance round. What you do is advance to capture a point, hold off a wave of enemies, and then do this two more times. On the last point, the Demon Prince himself will join the fight as a final boss. During all of this, you have a new resource called Supplies. You get them for murdering and a big chunk when capturing a new point. These let you build structures in designated areas on the parts of the map you control. There are four kinds of towers, which no matter your race get more shooty and explodey the mm. more you spend on them. I, I like that uh, bit of element that usually when there is a survive mode where you, you know, t you know fend off hordes of enemy like, uh, you know, wave system, right? Wave 1, wave 2, wave 3 that usually things have. You usually start with certain resources, you stick with that, but in the end, right? By the third wave, you're battered, you're low in, you know, resources, and you have to fight through. That kind of feels a bit too extreme. You have to make it more realistic, you know, in what you're doing, right? I guess if you're, if you're stuck at one place trying to, you know, fend off zombies, it's all, it makes sense, like, where are you going to get resources? But if you're doing something like this, uh, you know, you capture a point, of course, you're going to get resources from them, right? You can get a supplies for, for what you capture, there will be resources there that you can take, like how it works in normal warfare that has been working for thousands of years here. Somebody goes, uh, you know, capture a town, take resources from there and just continues. I like they kept that kind of element and not just, you know, give you one resource and that's it. Them, but also four kinds of wall structures which can behave differently. You could put down platforms for ranged infantry, structures that buff your guys or debuff the enemy, or yeah, a big fat wall they have to break through. You can also spend supplies on spawning and reinforcements because things just work weird in the realms of chaos. This includes being able to give your soldiers temporary upgrades for the battle. You can restore everything from magic to ammo to healing, though healing still has the caps. It plays sort of like a tower defense mode, but the flow isn't that controlled. It also depends on who you're fighting since each god has a different survival map. On some, towers can be incredibly powerful since the enemy barely has any options for dealing with them. Whereas Zinch's Fun Zone of Hell has plenty of ranged options and your towers will be the least of your worries. I've played quite a few of these and I'm still not sure how to feel about them. The word that keeps coming to mind is long. The fights take a long time, the map itself is long, but there's something not quite right about the flow of the level. Like in a tower defense game, the whole goal is to keep the bad guys out of the endpoint. If too many bad guys get in, then you lose. Except here you have an entire army you can keep in the center. Even as you progress to the next wave to make sure your tower resources weren't wasted, enemies will continue to spawn at the beginning of the level along with the new areas. The routes and room for maneuvering in these levels is very tunneled. It is tightly controlled and narrow, limiting what options you have. The farthest south of this mold is Zinch, who has pathways that go all over the place. It does frequently go into choke points, but it's a lot more interesting terrain-wise. Because the maps are so big, there are areas in it that have fun fight potential. The thing is, they intend you to bring a legendary lord with a loaded army into this map. Moving through it usually means narrowing your troops, and it feels sticky to control. The question is why would they want you to fight in these weird narrow areas to get to a more opened up control point? That's because you're fighting through the expressway lanes that were designed for the AI to go through. The map was designed for swarms of zombies to beeline towards a single point. The terrain has to get in the way of the enemies and curve them around, just like a tower defense game. If the enemy could run right at you, towers couldn't be as effective. 
fighting in lanes like this would frequently turn into a terrible blob fest. The enemy endlessly runs to a single point until you kill enough of them. Moving your troops too far and away from the center means they'll likely be overrun by the swarm. Yeah, but I guess, uh, you know, that kind of adds to the challenge, right? I mean, you have to tactically think about how you're going to approach certain place if it, if, you know, na if it narrows your path like that. And as far as it being, you know, feeling a bit grindy, uh, this battle, I guess that's the whole point of it, right? You're fighting in Chaos Realms. And chaos demons are kind of just that endless and you know endurance style I guess grinding is the way to go it feels long it feels like endless that's the whole point of it I guess it's lore friendly in a way so for most factions the answer is usually keep your guys in the point and let the towers pepper them on the way over control the choke points because that's what you do against overwhelming numbers I've had fun fights in this but usually with range centric armies because in regular battles, the enemy is targeting different key units of yours. Here it feels like they're beelining towards the point and just fighting whatever's in the way. So exploding them at range before they get there is very satisfying. Like a tower defense game. The final battle is one of these two and tries to account for it by dumping units directly on top of you. It's also worth noting that while quest battles have never been skippable in auto-resolve, these are. Fighting holdout siege battles can be a blast, but these are strange. The fun seems to depend on a specific loadout which you might not have since you fought regular battles on the way here. The realms do have some great regular old battle maps in them. They've already confirmed these battles won't be in the combined map, and I see why. They can be enjoyable, but I find them too limiting, and I can't see myself going out of my way to replay them. My head hurts from trying to figure this out. It's time for Korn. Korn is an angry god of violence, and his faction is led by Scarbrand, who is a one-man doomstack. <laughs> Korn is all about the supreme authority of violence. If you'd <laughs> like to be fighting all the time, this is where you go. That's not to say it's right-click the adventure, because... Korn is pure death metal. They should have had, like, Doom-style death metal music every time Korn's, Korn's demons are concerned. Like, holy shit, here they come. <laughs> there is some death to this. You'll notice demon factions do share some similar traits and some units, but we'll get to those as we go along. Korn wants more skulls for his skull throne. You have plenty of neighbors who can donate. The most efficient way to help the skull drive is directly through combat and conquest, but there are a few alternatives. A battlefield where two other races fought can leave a bunch of bodies behind, which means they're free skulls. You can also have your army conduct some blood trials in a new stance, which will cause attrition, make experience go up, and give you a small amount of skulls per turn. So what the hell do you do with all these skulls? Well, for one, you spend them on technology. These give you the latest scientific advancements in getting pissed off. You can also practice what you preach and directly FedEx. These give you the latest Skull for the Skull Throne as the Blood God's brass throne room fills to the ceiling with freshly harvested skulls. Okay, so there is an actual skill or trait, whatever name, Skull for the Skull Throne. Diplomatic relations, minus 10 with all factions. Skulls 20 per ton. The scientific advancements and getting pissed off. You can also practice what you preach and directly FedEx them off to the Skull Throne. This will give you all kinds of buffs for a series of turns and it only gets better with technology. When you regularly defeat a settlement, you can spawn a new army out of it. These blood armies must keep fighting or they'll begin to die. With the power of tech in the throne, these armies can spawn larger and last longer. It is funny just how much they want to fight. Skulls for the Skull Throne! Sail! 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 The throne can let you summon bloodletters onto the battlefield. It only gets better with time. Now, the way corn corruption and all demon corruption works is interesting. As it spreads throughout the world, you hit thresholds, which allow you to use unholy manifestations. Oh, Again, these are similar lagging. to Warhammer 2 rituals. These will give other temporary powers, like instantly obliterating a settlement, or giving Scarbrand a new army to fight for more skulls. However, every so often a god becomes ascendant for 10 turns, and these powers get even better. For example, now Scarbrand can fight a bigger army. So these are cool and engaging, but there's more. When corruption is high enough in an enemy area, it might spawn a cult of your god. This gives you some options for some undercity buildings. You can make them an income stream for your special resource, or destroy the cult for something special. In Scarbrand's case, he will instantly show up to wherever this is. This synergizes perfectly with him. He can Kool-Aid man fist his way through the planet and immediately start riling up blood armies. Your only limit is your upkeep. Now for one, Scarbrand has a murder meter similar to the Brass Bull, so that does take some stress off the economy. But the idea of a corn economy sounds like a paradox, but they made it work. If you have <laughs> one known settlement in a province, there's a chance your guys will take over any ruins in it for free. It's not much of economy, is it, when it comes to Chaos God? It's like, you know, Chaos God basically granting you certain things in return. I guess Chaos God gets happy every time you collect skulls or whatever. It's not much of really economy. It's not like, you know... 
yeah, here's a skull, and they're like, oh, now you get this. No, it's just like, God is getting more impressed with you or something. <laughs> you have territory under your influence, but you're still mostly free to burn everything down. The way corruption and all these new mechanics work together really is great. Corn plays like a bloodthirsty monster, but not in a way that feels like simple mashing. That said, Scarbrand truly can be a one-man army. They rose the character level cap to 50, so there are a lot more points to work with. But there is an issue across the heroes in near every faction where their skill set hasn't really grown to compensate for this. For example, at max level, the training skill still gives only 25 XP per turn. Every Lord's first redline skill gives 75. It is completely outclassed. It's almost like they haven't changed the design of their skill line since Warhammer 1. 2's DLC introduced all kinds of new interesting skill lines, and none of that is here. Even the treasure hunting in ruins is gone, and you can only scout for Skaven now, which are even more hilariously obvious. At first I wondered if Zinch heroes could booby trap ruins or something else interesting, but these are mainly stuck in the past, so that's unfortunate. But moving on, the corn roster is all about mauling the enemy in the face. There are no more donkeys of corn. The roster brought in- Maybe it's it's not really broken, right? It's OP because I guess, you know, Skullbrand being Khan's lieutenant like that, I mean, it would be so fucking good, right? Sk you know, sk playing as Skullbrand. I'm pretty sure you can, uh, you know, you can play as lieutenant, right? The new world trailer told us that. So playing as Skullbrand would be so fucking awesome. Spending skulls and you know, rising up your level. And obviously, you know, when it comes to fighting, right? Just point blank one on one or one on one versus all, just point blank fighting. Who can even come close to Khan, right? I mean, every other Chaos God says their own thing, but when it comes to pure out fighting and blood, Skull, it's just, you know, Khan is the one. And Khan's lieutenant, Skullbrand, obviously would be OP as fuck when it comes to actual battle, right? And you're playing as him, you can really become god-like powerful creature. And all new dedicated warriors, along with all their war gear. They're comparable to orcs in size and carry on the faction's spirit of getting into melee and killing. They don't do spells or magic or even ranged outside of some artillery. They just want to hit you in the face and take your skull. This is a joint task force of mortals and demons, and while you know people just run away, demons function a little bit differently. They can't actually die, but their soul goes back to the realms. In game, this means if their leadership is too low, they'll start crumbling and then vanish, very similar to undead. You'll need to consider who Ooh. in the army will fight to the death and who will rout and maybe come back for another chance. Korn's army is strong in combat and can become even more effective by killing. Killing enough enemies can unlock army-wide abilities, and even individual units might have a bonus too. You can essentially have your stronger units just eat enemy chaff, keeping them healthy. So there is no second wind if you're going against Khan, right? <laughs> you're going against Khan, you're losing, okay, because you're losing and so many people died, Khan's army is going to be even more powerful, so you better, you, 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 you're lost already, right? There is no second wind for you. There is no last moment victory, because it's Khan. I like how there is different AI mechanics right it's not like everybody else Khan's demons are not just gonna run away because they're fucking demons but they'll just you know you know just gonna disappear basically healthy and powering them up to fight a stronger battle they are an aggressive wrecking ball of an army and they play exactly how you think they would i don't have any real issues with these guys they're fun to play and full of flavor there are a raging red river on the battlefield and the campaign map i really like the event where a slanesh demon seduces one of the warriors Above the others, Korn hates Slanesh, so you either castrate your entire army or implement an official horny police. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Let's talk about Slanesh now. All right, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, Korn has Slanesh. Like, what is this shit? What you doing, man? <laughs> Slanesh, like, hmm, debauchery, BDSM. Like, what? What the fuck? We talking about honorable fighting here, blood and everything. What you? What the fuck is all that? What you doing there? <laughs> Let go of that soldier. <laughs> Oh, man, <laughs> this is so, such a good one. I like how every uh, different demons and every different chaos gods, you know, armies would fight differently. They have different type of things, different traits. They act differently. This game is so good and so much depth in it. It's all lore friendly. It's awesome. All right, people, that's it for now. We'll pick up next time, I guess. It's 30 minute mark, I guess. Yeah. If you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards. Check out the in cards. And I'll see you next time.